Um, uh, so uh, last time uh, where we broke off was um, uh, uh, we were discussing the uh, purity checking rules uh, for uh, Jesse uh, and Michael had um, uh, you know proposed this um, uh, very inside out uh, um, uh, compared to the way I was thinking of it where we were starting with the exports and working backward and that looked like it was uh, going to work out very well. And then I asked uh, Daria um, uh, how this, um, uh, how this approach, the overall static approach to purity, purifiable checking. So, um, uh, Daria, do you, would you like to uh, take it from there? Sorry, I, your audio disappeared. So oh. there was a whole, I don't know, I didn't hear it. I'm not sure whether everyone else did. No, I didn't either. Wow. Okay, what was the last thing you heard from me? You were introducing Daria. Ah, okay. Um, Before that, you were mentioning that you were going to uh, introduce her about, and then there was a gap, and then you told her to take over so <laughs> <laughs> yes. wonderful uh, um okay uh the so I was, I was just um mentioning that last meeting uh we ended with um uh it's just cut out again yeah it seems like the same thing is happening Imports down instead of from the imports up, uh, and that looked like it was going to work very well. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, I, I asked about how any of this compares with what's going on in Wyvern, and that's where we left the meeting last time. Uh, sorry, can I recommend? Um, you were talking about using um, a, a Bluetooth or a, like an external extension as a microphone. Can we try for this meeting to switch to a normal microphone? Uh, because I think we're getting the same issue from last meeting. I see. Yeah, OK. Um, um, just make sure you're using. People still hear me. All we heard was the still hear me. Okay. Does it still, does it seem any better now? Should be fine now, I think. Um, and Mark, double check in the pop up in the bottom left corner next to the mute. Let's make sure that Zoom is using the same uh, recording device. Ah, uh, Jabra USB. Uh, I'm a little bit suspicious because there's a, no, instead of. Yeah, same as system. Oh, oh, okay. Same as system. Okay. All right, just in case. That should increase the chances we're using USB and not Bluetooth. Does it seem any better? I see a thumbs down on um, Sala's. Ah, now we get a thumbs up. So I think, sounds like we're working. I see a check mark icon on Michael's. Yeah, it seems good. Okay, good. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Daria, I was wondering if you could tell us about, um, uh, the Wyvern module system and how Wyvern guarantees, um, uh, top level purity. So actually maybe could you, could you give a summary? What was the last time? I think I remember the code example. And actually, I did take a screenshot of that. So I could post that, the one about the make foo. And I thought that your question was specifically about that example, not in general. Uh, the, um, uh, which, wherever you want to start, um, uh, doing it specifically with regard to that example uh, would certainly be good. Um, the... Um, uh, so, actually, could, yeah, could you go ahead and post the example? 
Yeah, sure. How do I do this in Zoom? I guess share file in meeting. Okay, let's see if this works. Share the file. I, I think there are two options. You could uh, share screen. That, that would be one way to go about it. Um, um, but I think there's a whiteboard, which I've never really used. Uh, maybe I can try to share a whiteboard and see if you can put it on it. Huh. Yeah, that would be interesting. Sure, we could try that. Or I guess I could just try, I could share just the, let's, let's, let me try this. Actually, could you, I don't know how to take over the sharing. I tried sharing just the file or the. Yeah, sorry, I uh, took a second. So, so I did. I did get the file, but uh, but I would I would prefer if you could share your screen. Okay, good. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the shared screen. Yeah. So just the screenshot, right? That you see with the code. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The big so, the big advantage of the shared screen is I can also see your cursor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to kind of talk a bit about this particular example? Why, what was the challenge in this one? And then I could answer some questions or because I'm just to be like out of context. I'm not sure what exactly I'm supposed to say. Okay. Um, uh, the, so, so a, the way we got to this example is that is by contrasting putting the count variable inside the make foo versus putting the count variable uh, at top level. Um, and if there's top level mutable state, then of course make foo um, uh, is not actually pure. Uh, whereas if the count variable is inside the make foo, uh, then make foo is pure, uh, but foo is not pure. Um, and uh, uh, and then, uh, so now, the, and then the question was, and the question we were examining is, do we have a set of static checking rules that we understand that are sound and will make those decisions? In other words, that in this code, make foo is pure, so this is a well-formed pure module, whereas if count is outside, then make foo is not pure and would be rejected by the purity checker. And Michael came up with a variant of putting count outside um, that for our current static checking rules would actually create an unsoundness and it had to do with uh, the rules around the uh, uh, indexed array mutation syntax. Michael, uh, please help me out here. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> essentially, um, the way I understand the escaping rules is that anything returned by a module must not be able to produce something that can be used for communication between modules. Yes. And uh, so my example was if we have an unhardened array on the outside of make foo, so say we have an array counters. Uh, whose content is mutable, then from within make foo, if we reference that counters array, some index on the array, that would have been allowed by the old static checking rules. But basically what I was coming towards is um, when we harden a value for export from a function, we essentially need to harden its return values and those return values and so on and so on until we get something like the current example is on the screen. So I don't, um, I, I, uh, so uh, Jesse uh, only hardened values are supposed to escape, but I think that that issue is um, distinct and separable from the modules must be pure issue. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, um, uh, and the so so in part, so the reason uh, 
the reason why I was very curious about how all this compares with Wyvern is that in uh, SES and Jesse, we're assuming a language that we cannot soundly statically type. So nothing depends on any kind of uh, static type analysis. Uh, the things we can do soundly are reason about scope and uh, within a scope reason about um, uh, you know, uh, control flow and, and uh, use occurrences and defining occurrences and all this, um, uh, which is what we, and that's all we've been leaning on. Um, uh, but in Wyvern, you've got a, a, a fully statically typed language with, an, with a, uh, a type system that's uh, quite ambitious. Right, okay, so how this compares to Wyvern, first of all, we don't have a notion of a pure function. Well, in, in the sense how it's presented here, we can talk about pure modules, right? And then m like module, module functors themselves are pure, but we don't really discuss the functions themselves as pure or non-pure necessarily. Or so, so here it looks to me like it, it would be something like at the, in Wyvern, it would be at the top level function, but the top level have pretty much any authority that's available. So the top level is not pure. And then if it was, say, if the function make foo was in a separate file, so that would be a module definition, then the fact that the count is, uh, I believe it's a mutable field, right? So, so that, yeah. Uh, so the, the count here is not a field, it's just a lexical variable uh, that's captured by the nested uh, foo function. Right, so is it mutable? It's, it's mutable, right? It's not immutable. That's correct, that's correct. Yes. And in so fact, if, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, so the, the, the line count equals count plus one we're actually mutate. We're actually assigning the lex the the to the assignable count variable. Right. So, what it would be in Wyvern, like if it was in the module, so then this count would be a field. Then, if it is a mutable field, then then make foo module would be would be a resource module. And then, if the count field is immutable, then it is it could be a pure one, depending what else is in the module. So if, uh, could you say that again? I think I got confused about something. Okay, so the, in Wyvern potentially, this could be a separate module, like make foo could be a module functor. Okay. Then if the count is a mutable field, then by our definition, make foo would be a resource module. Well, the count I would think would be a mutable field, the equivalent Wyvern code uh, for the, for what's on the screen right now would be that count would be a mutable field of the foo function, not of the make foo function. Because I mean, what this code is doing is every time you call make foo, it makes a new count variable and a new foo function that captures that count variable. Mm -hmm. So this is not a functor. It's a, the functor is actually the ac external module that exports make foo. I so, did. Uh, so make foo is just happens to be the export of this module, but in my understanding of functors, the actual module functor itself is pure here. If I understand uh, what's going on with Wyvern, uh, there's two kinds of module. There's pure modules and resource modules. The resource modules are, can really be seen as um, uh, uh, implicitly a, a, you know, a pure module that's exporting a pure functor. Uh, this one, since what it's exporting is already pure, I would think would correspond directly to a Wyvern pure module, in which case there is no implicit functor, we're ju we just export what we seem to be exporting. Is that okay. correct? So are you talking about make foo or foo? Make foo. Make foo would, would be pure, you're saying? Yes, make foo is pure. In Wyvern. Uh, 
It uh, won't yeah. be pure because count is a mutable field. But count isn't, it's a mutable field of foo. It's not a mutable field of make foo. Because every time you call make foo, you get a new count variable. You get as, there's, there are as many count variables as there are foo functions. Yeah, but in make foo, if there was something else, so the count in make foo can change though, right? Like it's, it's it, declared say, as mutable. Okay, but when you say in make foo, it's inside the code of make of make, of the make foo function, but the code is ex is executed per invocation of make foo. Well, from the syntactic standpoint, if it is declared in Wyvern, so we have vars and val, so val is immutable, var is mutable. If count is declared as var, make foo okay. is going to be a resource regardless of whether that field is used or not, whether it's modified or not. Does, okay. does Wyvern have the ability to capture variables and closures? Or yes. Not? It does. So make, make foo is just a plain function. It's not a, it doesn't have any fields. And that function creates a, another function which does capture an internal lexical variable, not a field. Yes, but as I started, so function in itself, so in Wyvern, it can be either a top level function or it can be a function inside a module. And we don't talk about, oh, this function is pure or not. We talk more, we're more interested in whether the module is pure or not. So if this is a top level function, then it's kind of irrelevant for us whether it's pure or not. It's, it's located in the, in the top level, which has access to any kind of resources. So it's already presumably like it, it, it can do whatever it wants. Uh, so and if it is in the, in the module, then I, I kind of translated this into if the make foo was the module functor. So it was on its own, like it was producing a, a module. That's what I've been talking about. Otherwise it would be a function inside a module. Okay. So, um, okay. So I, I, th I, th so, um, I think I understand now what I was misunderstanding. Um, I was thinking in terms of uh, everything we're seeing, first of all, being inside a Wyvern module, not, when you say top level, when you're talking about Wyvern, um, uh, you're talking about sort of the main of an application, the thing that has all the authority of the process? Yes, sort of. Okay. Um, uh, so, so I was, uh, yeah, so I was definitely thinking about this as inside a module rather than at top level. Um, and I was thinking about uh, this code appearing literally uh, as a Wyvern function definition defining a function make foo. Um, uh, um, and where the module itself uh, was declared to be a pure module and then asking would Wyvern approve this code as being the co the you know as, as being the code for a pure module meaning that make foo is not a functor but is just a exported pure value right so, so what I understand of the functors is that there is an implicit functor here that has no name that returns make foo as the only, definition of the module. Only if, it's a, if the module is declared as a resource module. So an equivalent in Wyvern, I think, would be that the make foo is returning a lambda. Yes. And that lambda is capturing the count variable. Yes. Precisely. So I'm actually not sure what it would be counted. So the make foo itself, like as a function, since it has a count, it's just a local variable. So that's okay, according to our current rules. I think it can be, it can be inside a pure module. Okay, good. So, but then what happens with the capture, I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Because actually in our paper, we, 
we don't see like we don't uh, consider lambdas lambdas would have to be translated as objects with with uh, their own uh, sorry the objects with methods and then the returned object here would be i think would be resource but the make foo is can still be pure okay good 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 that, that's 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 what i was hoping the answer is um and uh, uh, give us a, can you give us an intuition about what the static purity checking rules are by which uh, Wyvern would approve MakeFoo as being pure? The rules would be that, so the, it takes no argument, so it, it gets no resources from the outside. Also, the assumption is that the module in which make foo is is also pure, so there's no um, there are no resources around, and there's no state inside the module itself. And it's okay to have local variables inside functions, and we it can it can return a resource. Okay, so good. That's good, and if there. Uh, is in this module a um, uh, mutable state, but the mutable state is not reachable from what the module exports. Uh, this is one of the issues that uh, came up in the um, original uh, purifiable checking rules for Jesse uh, that Kate and I defined versus uh, Michael's suggestion from last time, is we were reasoning um, bottom up and um, uh, Michael was reasoning top down from the exports. If there was top level mutable state that was not reachable, uh, then by Michael's rules, that did not cause the, the, the module uh, to be uh, uh, judged impure. When you say top level here, do you mean there's something inside the module surrounding this, the function or? Do you mean yeah, top level as the very top? So yeah, let's let's say that above MakeFu, or uh, there was a um, separate declaration of something um, that um, uh, got mutated maybe during module initialization, um, but um, uh, it was not there was it was not reachable from any of the exports. So uh, to any other module um, uh, importing with this module exports, there is no observable mutable state. And there's no communications channel. So in Wyvern, it would depend on how, suppose, so it sounds like you're talking about say a field, right? And the field could be either mutable or immutable. And then it could be during initialization, the right-hand side could be using I don't know, re maybe a resource or something. So I don't yeah. know, for us, the rules, I think in your lingo that you just established, it would be also kind of top down. So in Wyvern, we would okay. see whether if it's a mutable field is declared as a mutable field, the module automatically becomes resource regardless of whether that field is used or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're doing like a very conservative approach in that sense. Okay, so that, so, um, so okay. Okay, uh, good. That was clear. That actually cor corresponds, I think, closer to what I was calling uh, the bottom-up approach that, that Kate and I were doing. Oh, okay. Well, then bottom-up. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so, yeah, just to clarify, um, what, what I was actually suggesting at the end of that meeting was an outside-in approach where we say all the module-level declarations have to be hardened and all the exports upwards need to be hardened as well. Say, say that again. So uh, what we had left us with is um, I was suggesting that make foo as it stands, because it's a function declaration, it is mutable state. Yes. So I was suggesting maybe we don't want to allow that. Maybe if, it, if it's a top level dec declaration in the, sorry, not top level, module level declaration. Uh, then we want to make all of those hardened. So the 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 makefu is being hardened on the last line 
of the text on the screen. That's a good point, yes. Which makes it legal, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, um, so uh, Michael, is are you trying to actually um, um, uh, build a um, purity checker for uh, Jesse, Jessica? Um, <clears throat> well, this is where uh, this proposal that I currently have, which I named Purify, which actually isn't Purify anymore either. Uh, it's more like Defend. <laughs> um, which uh, defend became hardened because it, it became freezing the objects transitively. And uh, what I'm talking about in Purify is actually not what corresponds to Wyvern's definition of pure modules. Okay. Um, okay. What I'm talking about is a tool that Jesse programmers can use to do a deep and recursive hardening of a value and all the functions in it that export values that, or that return values. And so a, a deep harden of some sort that would not have to be, um, would not have to be bulletproof against the, the things that SES can create, but is just a tool for Jesse programmers to say, everything that I made in this object should be hardened. And I don't want to add hardened annotations to the ends and beginnings of all my functions. And it would do that by actually wrapping the functions with other functions. Yes, I, I can show you the precise code that I have with it so far if you want. Yes. Uh, if my mouse came back. <laughs> okay, here's my mouse. This will take a couple seconds. Okay, and you wanted to cover something today, right? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, um, af uh, Michael, after you walk us through uh, this code, um, since I need to, I need to leave at two today, oh, and, yes, and, there, and, and there was something that Kate wanted to cover uh, before I, I, I leave. So let's go ahead and do your code, but then after that, we're going to to, to change topics for the rest of this meeting. Absolutely. Uh, feel free to stop me anytime too. We can take take this up later if you need time today. Okay. Um, okay. So here I have something. That's the wrong binary. That's the right one. Um, so I called it Purify, but please bear in mind that the this is not the right name. Okay. Um, so what I'm talking about here is a primitive that takes a root. This is the function that it defines. Uh, takes a root object maybe wraps it if it's a function, and then calls a hardener that recursively wraps the, the objects that it finds, or the functions okay. that it finds. So purifying hardener, I took as this uh, PR that I submitted to the make hardener repository. Oh, Where basically okay. I have- sorry, I, I, I saw it, but I had not noticed that it was a PR. I oh yes, not, okay. That's <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you let me know that. Okay, good. Yeah, so essentially the make hardener, uh, Agoric make hardener node module allows you to create a hardener from a given set of uh, root uh, fringe objects or initial. Yeah. So the make harden that I have here is actually just one that's been curried against the initial fringe and takes a second argument as a freeze argument to say this is the object freeze we're going to be using and if it's not specified default to object.freeze. Wow, okay. Okay, so I make a purifying hardener that says 
the freeze that I try to do is I try to wrap the functions in the object and then I freeze it. Okay. So it just does a best effort at this. If it's in the, in the realm of strange proxies or already frozen objects, it won't be able to do its job. But if Jesse has neither of those, this will work quite well. So it will just simply go through the object keys and say, for each of the keys in the argument, set the key to a maybe wrapped function of that key. And then after it does all those sets, computed set is an endowment because Jesse doesn't have computed set. Um, and freeze, then it actually calls the, the regular freeze on it. The regular object of freeze. Mm -hmm. So the wrapper uh, just keeps a track of its current wrapped functions. And if it's not a function, we don't wrap it. We just return it so it can be frozen. And if it is a function, then we see if we've cached it already. And if not, we make a wrapper that calls purify on the results of the function. So this make foo example could be written as um, const make foo equals purify for better lack lack of a name uh, and then function body in here. Right, you wouldn't need to harden foo or harden what it returns because your outer thing is doing all of that transitively, but it's doing it by wrapping. It's very membrane-y, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's weird because if you see the function directly, you're going to wrap it. Uh, if you get a non-function, then, then, I, then I come back up to here where I say I do the computed set of all the properties to a maybe wrapped key. I think I don't understand the computed set. Computed set is just uh, arg, arg bracket key equals value. We don't have that in Jesse. So I need oh, to oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So you're going to modify the objects in place. Is that right? Uh, if I, if I have, if, 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 if the, if the argument to purify is a object literal with two, with two methods, does the object, the, the object literal evaluates to an object. Um, Which keeps the identity of, yes, that's right. You're going to keep the identity and you're going to replace the, the properties in place. Correct. Okay. Um, I definitely find this very weird and counterintuitive, but maybe it's just because it's different than the way I've been thinking of it. Um, okay. I think I'm going to call a, a halt to this topic and uh, give the floor to Kate. Sounds okay. good. Um, so I had just a couple of things. Um, first, I was wondering what people would think of using the first 30 minutes of the Tuesday calls as kind of a business um, time. So there might be particular decisions that need to be made, um, it, news announcements, that sort of thing. So we'd kind of separate out like uh, the deep dives from the items that need everyone's attention. Um, so I wanted to get thoughts on that. And I was thinking um, if we really wanted to get into it, we could have a Google Doc for each meeting that would have the business items that need to be decided on. So that if people aren't able to make that particular time for whatever reason, they can still you know, uh, approve or disapprove offline. 
Yeah, and one example of something that um, you know, we need some decision-making feedback on is um, uh, right now the shim is inside the uh, proposal realm repository. Uh, we got some uh, good feedback uh, in particular from Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, that uh, the best practice is to uh, take, so take things like the shim and the tests for the shim and move them out into a separate repository. Um, uh, so we've started, we actually have that separate repository ready to go, but we don't yet have agreement from the stakeholders in the existing repository. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> sorry, could I uh, also bring one point um, that is related to those two? Um, I, I think um, um, from my work with the modules group, um, it has been very, very helpful to have this repository that is like really not code related. It's um, organization related um, and it's projects. Uh, we have project boards. Um, we're just using the GitHub tools we're familiar with to organize our process in general. Um, and on that topic, the one recommendation I made early on when I joined is to have a terminology document. We didn't do a good job at that one. Uh, but uh, the whole idea was uh, I was trying to catch up um, on concepts that I missed because uh, you know these meetings, people join, leave, and come back and everything. So, um, so that, that's one example of a document that could live in this repository. So there's a document about uh, business aspects, you know, and various documents, but there's also uh, knowledge documents for people who are looking to catch up on certain things. Um, and that's a little different than a forum where um, these are, are documents, you know, like a booklet um, that grows over time versus discussions that occur um, maybe uh, in the forum versus uh, discussions that will occur on actual decision items which we would like to keep with the same documents they affect. Mm -hmm. So uh, would it be a good idea to uh, pose that question? Um, if we should start a, a repository uh, for admin? But for the terminology, did you find sufficient to read the document, the Google Doc, which has the current proposal? Um, like, I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't do a good job doing my homework. Uh, you, you guys had that document uh, from, like I've seen it maybe the first meeting, and I read through it, I printed it about seven times, I never finished reading it though. Um, so, um, so but, but that's me, that's my style of actually um, going about reading things when that's like the worst skill I have. Um, uh, but the terminology document in Node, um, um, at least for the two, three definitions that we got ourselves to work on, uh, really helped at that point. Um, so, um, so the Google Docs are, are kind of like work, works in progress of a particular topic. They are productions that you would get out of collaboration. Um, but I think if we're moving towards this being a project, having um, a repo where project business is in that repo and things that happen because of the project are, are you know, auxiliary things um, in the right format and the right medium, um, that, that would be uh, more structured for newcomers at least. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure um, we, you know, we would all benefit from it, um, but it does take effort. Okay. I said, um, so I'm, a little, I'm a little wary of having, you know, more and more places to look for information. But um, I do like the idea of using a repo versus Google Docs for the meeting items. Um, that way, you know, it's all in one place that people are already familiar with and know how to use. Um, I was actually going to say the opposite. I think the Google Doc, one Google Doc would be good. And I, I wanted, so for the terminology, we could potentially start the Google Doc, like put something at the very bottom of the Google Doc, have a bookmark to it, and then send new people to that specific bookmark. And then in the Google Doc, we could have kind of a log for every single meeting, including maybe not only the administrative stuff, but also maybe a summary or at least a bullet 
point about what was discussed in this meeting. And we could also include, say, uh, if there was a recording of that, we could include a YouTube link in the same document. And that way we could, we're gonna have a log of all the meetings. Yeah, they, they definitely have uh, separate advantages. Um, I, I guess I didn't, I wasn't part of making the decision when No decided to go that direction. Uh, but I did find that when, when, um, when we are lost in the threads, um, having this central repo, opening an issue and saying like, wait a second, where is everybody actually busy at right now? You know, this kind of um, centralized place that is already designed to track issues that has checklists, um, although is not ideal for authoring a document for sure, um, it's better for code, but, but still, all markdown content that we author uh, benefits from the PR review, uh, benefits from you know, um, all these things that developers use. Um, so, so again, it's, it's really what, what the group um, would be more inclined to be comfortable with. Uh, that, that matters at the end of the day. Um, you will find very positive things for both and very negative things for both. I, that, that's, you know, my best guess, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see um, the benefit of having a PR process so that, uh, you know, uh, people don't, people are okay making changes and submitting them without feeling like they're overriding other people's changes you know, that, that there's a clear process for adding things. I could also see that being a barrier if people aren't as comfortable with, you know, it's it's much easier just to type in Google Docs than it is to submit a PR for, you know, if, if that's not what people are comfortable with, but. Um, that was me, by the way, because the first PR I did was like literally on my terminology. Um, so I write code that I think other people are using. I, I just, my process has lived far away from GitHub, other than it being the place where if my time machine breaks, <laughs> it's on GitHub, basically. So, so I learned a lot about PRs mm -hmm. for, for uh, working on markdown files, which was like <laughs> weird. Uh, and then I, I did some PR work on code too, which was new. Um, but but um, you know, if, if we are predominantly comfortable with working on PR, um, uh, style, um, you know, that, then that would not be um, a big issue. But if, if we feel that, you know, having a PR to change a typo is um, going to be a barrier, then definitely a repo will be more challenging um, mm -hmm. for some, some members in the group. So let me suggest that um, uh, both for a GitHub repo and for a Google Doc, uh, we would want the document to be publicly readable, publicly suggestible, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, uh, but then have a, um, you know, a, a, a white list of those with direct revision or commit rights. So in the Google Doc, the way I would do that is uh, say that anyone with the link can comment. Uh, if you can comment, then you can uh, read the document in a suggesting mode where you can actually uh, take the user interface actions that would normally be edits, but then those become um, uh, like comments uh, as edit suggestions with, with, that somebody with commit rights can accept or reject. Um, uh, and then uh, any of us as committers would be able to either accept or reject those or make uh, revisions directly if we like. Uh, and I think basically that same distinction carries over into GitHub. So I think that the access control issue about um, uh, making revisions directly uh, and who has the ability to do that versus submitting a PR is kind of cuts across, you know, we can make the same decision with either medium. Got it. Okay, I think in that case, I would be inclined to use Google Docs because um, I think there's less friction there. I agree. Okay, um, 
So I can start to put together that Google Doc and send it out to folks. Uh, and what did people think about the 30 minute um, at the start of the Tuesday meeting suggestion? I think it's, it's a good idea. I'm just not sure it's going to every time require 30 minutes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we would get, we would, it would be um, a maximum of 30 minutes, not a, a minimum. Right. Yeah. And probably it may be a good idea to follow up on uh, on Mark's email about the, the general that the meeting starts at 105 and then there's going to be the discussion of this kind after that and then it finishes at this time. So to add to the structure to the meeting. Right. So I guess just send everyone the, the, an email about this again. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's good to uh, frame it as people um, should try their best to be available Tuesdays, the first half an hour, even if they are busy, you know, to try to make sure that this time slot is available for, for business related discussions that might take place um, if, if, they, if they are, you know, going to take place this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, I hope you all saw my, uh, the email I sent to CES Strategy, where I was suggesting that in general, our meetings, both Tuesday and Thursday, uh, start at 105 and are expected to end at 250, because um, that would fit most smoothly with people who are trying to find time for these meetings within an otherwise busy day. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, uh, another related decision would be, and, and um, uh, they added a feature to Zoom called breakout rooms, um, is that um, very specific discussions that are uh, maybe um, sometimes taken offline and done at a different venue. Um, people who want to, who have like two or three people who are, you know, very closely related in a discussion, that is maybe out of the context of the two hour meeting, um, also have the ability to at any time, if they would like to schedule a separate time or a, you know, follow up after the meeting, they could have a breakout room where they can do that discussion and we can have more than one discussion happening in those separate breakout rooms. Uh, I haven't done it before, but it's a feature in Zoom. So when sometimes there is uh, you know, ad hoc, um, work that people would like to use the same tools for, Zoom uh, meetings can be an option. Okay. Um, let's see. So I had a, a, a couple of decision-making points that I think require um, other folks to be, um, to be on, other stakeholders. But uh, one last thing is that, um, so our safe modules document has been transformed into a GitHub repo and GitHub pages website. Um, so let's see, let me post that in the chat. Uh, so that's the repo. And then right now it's um, available through the Agoric website. And this is just for lack of a better place to put it, you know. Um, there's a js.org um, where you basically just go to this repo and add um, a, a subdomain name uh, and they will host your GitHub pages at hmm. subdomain.js.org. Hmm. I, I don't know how popular that would be. I don't know what the motivations of the people behind it are, but it's powered by Cloudflare for CDN. Uh, hmm. And it seems like it's a very, very organic way to get um, a nice subdomain before somebody else does. Uh, I don't know if they have a disputes process. Um, I don't know if we're interested. Uh, it's free, I think. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'd be interested in exploring it. What was the, it was just js. js.org. Yeah. Huh. You just do a PR against their their subdomains, and you're like, okay, it might take 24 hours, and it takes like 24 seconds, really. But so, what's the what's the advantage of this over GitHub Pages? 
Oh, it's just GitHub pages, but you don't have to do like uh, .github.io, and and you know, or if you host it, you don't have to host it as a subdomain to a URL um, that might not be very related. Um, it just says it's a uh, js.org is a very very uh, focused, um, you know, um, domain to be a subdomain of if you're if you're not related to something specific other than JS. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, so I, I just thought by accident, and I was like wondering, um, you know, I wasted half an hour thinking of all the subdomains I'm going to block, but like it didn't. <laughs> so. Cool. Yeah, uh, I I'll have a question that. about the document management from now on. So before it was a Google Doc, and so I, for example, I could edit it now. So, and the document, especially the one on the guard.com, it mm -hmm. seems. Well, it's a copy from the Google Docs, and I think there are quite a few to-dos left. Right, yeah, so there are. So what's the process now? So it, um, any changes should be made as PRs, I think, to the GitHub repo. Yeah. Um, but we still, there's still a lot of um, changes that we know that we need to make based on comments from the Google Doc. Yeah, I, I made a big, uh, uh, I've been going through the Google Doc uh, the, the, the comments on the Google Doc uh, and um, uh, revising the document uh, under Git in order to close out the remaining comments on the Google Doc. And I've only gotten through about a third of the, of the, um, of the Google Doc uh, uh, with regard to that so far. Uh, but I do plan to, to complete my revision pass. Uh, and at that point, I plan to, uh, you know, a after I complete this one pass, uh, I'm hoping to just stay on the GitHub version and uh, no longer need to pay attention to the Google Doc version. But, but, uh, but I, will, I will pay attention until all of those outstanding comments are closed out. But the GitHub version doesn't have a copy of the safe modules document, does it? It doesn't have a copy of the what? The safe modules document. Yes, it, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, is that not? So in the repo under docs is where the, oh, right, right. the document is. Right. Is it in the photo video, I guess? Yeah, OK, I see. Yeah, doc, doc, yeah, uh, docs index.md. OK. So it, but then if I want to make any changes, I'll have to submit a pull request, right? Uh, or uh, actually, for all of us here that are actively engaged, we should just um, uh, give us commit rights um, to the safe modules document. And then, as we discussed with uh, uh, previously with regard to um, uh, modification rights versus uh, suggest rights, um, uh, we should just give you uh, commit rights to the repository, and then you can make the changes any changes you want directly uh, that you want to make directly, and then uh, anything where you'd like to uh, do the equivalent of a doc suggest, uh, you can do that with the pull request. But, but for you, I would say, uh, don't be inhibited about just changing it directly. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. I think we have to go. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, until next time, bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.